uh, and thank you for your leadership and the great team you put together uh, over at the chamber. Uh, as uh, you know, I've had a chance to represent a great deal of South Texas, just not all at once. Uh, and here in San Antonio, if you wonder, you've, you've had the uh, uh, pleasant opportunity to visit uh, at this good series of meetings with my colleagues where Congressional District 35 is. You do need a computer pretty much to figure it out, but you're in it right now, and it incorporates uh, all of downtown, the uh, area going up almost to Hildebrand, the near west side. I saw Gabe here from the West Chamber earlier, uh, out to the east side of Our Lady of the Lake campus, then around uh, to include uh, all of the missions except Espada. A particular interest of mine is trying to get that missions bill passed. We have it now through the House, and uh, it was considered in Senate uh, committee just before we left, and I hope we see some favorable action over there in the Senate. Uh, then I go around, I get about a third of Harlandale, uh, some of the area around Highlands High School in the southeast, up through the near east side, uh, all of downtown Kirby, but none of Live Oak or Universal City until I pick up a part of Selma and Shirts, downtown New Braunfels, and all the way to North Austin. So it's a, a very uh, unusual district. Uh, but it has some uh, shared concerns. And uh, what I really propose to do without any formal text is just to have as best we can in this short time a community conversation about some of the issues uh, that I'm hearing from the most and invite your, your comments and, and questions and stay a few minutes afterwards for any that we don't get to do. I salute the chamber, uh, especially for its SA to DC trips and the uh, role that your various committees have played in shaping a legislative delegation. I think Priscilla said she's already at work uh, with Richard on planning for next year's trip. Uh, the, uh, the last time, in fact, I spoke to the chamber was in the midst of a snowstorm up in Washington. Now we have a storm on the inside of the building that's a little different, uh, but it's uh, uh, a storm nevertheless. Uh, we are, as you know, in the midst of a congressional recess, though for most, most people it's been hard to tell the difference since this uh, Congress has been so unproductive and has accomplished so little when it was in session, uh, not much difference now that we're out. Uh, on key issues that I think are important to me and are important uh, to our community, uh, I guess the one that I'm drawn to the most by uh, his, personal history and by what I have seen uh, throughout Bear County uh, is education. Uh, in our family, it begins really young uh, in that my wife uh, now heads the President's Early Childhood Initiative and has devoted her professional life to early childhood. And our daughter, Kathy, is a coordinator at, for early childhood education at the Regional Service Center just north of here, beginning in New Braunfels and covering 60 different districts. I think the evidence is quite clear that investing in our youngest Texans and youngest Americans really has an economic payoff. And San Antonio, I was out uh, uh, here about 10 days ago to present some flags to the uh, new Pre-K for SA Center, which is just uh, an extraordinary facility, but more importantly, uh, the commitment of the community and the involvement of some master teachers to really show the country what a difference it can make to make that investment in our youngest Americans. Uh, we struggle through many challenges in our public schools and our multiple school districts here. Uh, appreciate Katie's work on that. The, uh, the area that I've worked in uh, nationally has been in incentives for uh, post-public education, uh, that is principally college education, and of all the uh, many school districts that I have and 
colleges within this area. The, I have all the downtown UTSA campus, and I guess the largest institution within this particular congressional district, and a very important one to me are the Alamo colleges, both SAC and St. Phillips, though I know we have uh, students within this area that attend the other uh, campuses. Uh, I uh, authored and uh, now seek permanent extension. It's extended another five years a tax credit that allows those who are in higher education or post-secondary education to take $2,500 directly off their tax bill for tuition and instructional materials uh, that I think is a good incentive when added to uh, Pell Grants and we have some changes that we're making in the law in that regard, I hope we're making the law in the course of the Work in the Ways and Means Committee. I've been very impressed. I know we have a number of people here from Port San Antonio uh, at the work of the Alamo Colleges and the internship program there. I think that's the kind of targeted employment program to match uh, young people with jobs that we need, that will grow our community, uh, that we need to be focused on. Uh, indeed, uh, we have some changes that I know the Chamber has been interested in in the Perkins Act uh, on technical education. But all up and down the line, there may, it may make little sense in business to, to take the philosophy of build it and they will come. But when you're talking about workforce, there may be some truth in that. That to the, we focus on individual educational opportunity, but this is about workforce development and having a skilled workforce here in the community that will continue to attract uh, good paying long-term jobs. Very related to that topic of education uh, is what's happening or not happening with reference to immigration. Uh, on the whole, my general uh, attitude on the subject, and we have a forum tonight at UTSA with a number of uh, different groups that are participating uh, to talk about nothing else uh, and to hear comments about immigration. But immigration is directly related uh, to workforce development and to our economy. And the only way we will get it adopted in this Congress is if there is more engagement from every sector of the business community. I believe San Antonio has so much to gain economically. There may be some of us, and it's true of many people, that there are multiple reasons that uh, we care about immigration reform, but there are many of us that are drawn by the family values argument of tearing families apart, of having visited, uh, as I did not long ago, with some of the young Dream students, Dreamer students out at uh, SAC, and seeing the tremendous potential they have in wanting and being pulled by our hearts, uh, as well as our pocketbook to support immigration reform. But I think to get some variant of the Senate bill approved, a comprehensive approach, it will be pocketbooks that make the difference and the involvement and engagement of the business community. The Senate bill in concept, not very different than what uh, George W. Bush advocated a few years ago that never made it out of the Senate. In the House, uh, there has been a reaction that this needs to be done on a piecemeal basis and that we ought to avoid large comprehensive bills. What that really means is I want my piece and you don't get your piece, and that's a problem. I think it has to be done on a comprehensive basis. I know from some companies here uh, visiting recently at Rackspace, as well as some of the technology uh, companies that I've worked with traditionally uh, north of here, uh, that the H-1B visa and the STEM, uh, whole area of STEM visas is extremely important. But we're not going to get that piece of it, as Lamar learned when he advanced it a year ago, unless we get some resolution of the other issues here. Uh, some of the, the changes that are recommended by the House Committee as part of a piecemeal approach really take us back. They're not going to make it. I'm hopeful that by the end of the year, there'll be enough interest and enough involvement that we'll get back to a point where some Republicans and some Democrats can come together to pass a comprehensive bill. It may not look exactly like the Senate bill, it probably won't, but the basic concepts of that bill, that we move forward with a path to citizenship, even if it's a long, hard path for those who pay their taxes and work and contribute to our community, and that we get some border security, uh, though we already have a great deal of money uh, invested in that area, and I'm not sure 
uh, that significant new investment will add that much, but I think it's a, it's a trade-off and there'll be some give and take. And if that happens, uh, I believe it'll be the one significant piece of legislation uh, that this Congress approves. Let me move quickly on to health care. I had the first protest against Obamacare in the country at a grocery store out in southwest Austin in 2009 when the bill was being considered. People came in from 150 miles around to yell down the meeting, uh, to kind of set off that series. As I told that Tea Party group, you know, I wish that this bill were as good as you think it is bad. I'm aware that there are many uh, shortcomings within this legislation. Uh, but it is what it is, and uh, one of the reasons it has withstood 40 votes to, appeal, to repeal it uh, is that there haven't been very many good alternatives advanced to the approach taken to rely on private insurance exchanges to deliver care. Uh, indeed, to be bipartisan about it, if you go back to the office this afternoon and you pull up uh, GOP.gov, and you look at what their alternative is to Obamacare, uh, which uh, they advanced since they proposed to repeal it in January of last year, and you will see work in progress. And the reason it's still a work in progress is that they don't have a good alternative to advance to the concept of private insurance exchanges. This would be the first major piece of legislation in the healthcare area or really any other social service area, uh, even including the prescription drug coverage that was added for seniors under uh, President Bush, where we haven't had a technical corrections bill. There are other changes that uh, have been advanced, including by some of the individuals who are here today. We need to make some of those changes, but as long as the alternative is keep it or repeal it, we will not make progress in refining that. On Friday, I'm visiting uh, with some of the folks from uh, University Health, uh, for, with Judge Wolf, who I talked with this morning. He's leading that effort to discuss what can we do to take advantage of the dollars that are there uh, that will be available in the form of tax credits to help thousands of families here in Bear County who do not have insurance today have access to a private insurance plan. They will get those tax credits to help them pay the premiums. We know that we are in the peculiar situation that really the poorest of the poor, they won't qualify for that because despite uh, Judge Wolf coming to Austin and saying he would cut taxes, cut property taxes here in Bear County if the state of Texas would accept 100 cents on the dollar for Medicaid dollars, and despite the, the consequences that you talked about, George, for the, the health system here, we didn't do that. We don't have Medicaid dollars. We don't have an insurance exchange. The state even uh, indicated that it wouldn't uh, support or enforce the insurance reforms that are designed to provide us additional protection on insurance policies that are obtained through the uh, health insurance exchanges. So I'm hopeful that we will see come October 1st more and more of our neighbors who can sign up in those exchanges, some small businesses that haven't been able to afford to provide insurance for their employers across especially the southwest and east side portions of the territory that I represent, that those new opportunities are there. There will be problems, and I hope that over time we can see those resolved. There'll be many of our neighbors who will not qualify because of these decisions that were unfortunately made in Austin, but I believe we will be moving forward uh, in a productive way. Lastly, uh, just a quick summary of the budget and how it relates to everything else, because I began this New Year's, instead of being here to speak at ceremonies honoring our new Court of Appeals judges as I had intended in Washington deal dealing with the fiscal cliff. We are headed to another one. We are headed to another one, uh, both because uh, we've got some folks, uh, as you know, who are saying, uh, shut down the government, forget the full faith and credit of the United States, we just need to kill Obamacare. Uh, they refer to some of their fellow Republicans as the Surrender Caucus, uh, which is a, a strange place to find ourselves in. But I think I would bring it home to just one issue, and that's a letter that I got from Richard on behalf of the uh, chamber and on behalf of the Hispanic chamber here uh, in mid-July, asking me to support 
the funding level for the transportation, housing, and urban development bill that had been approved in the Senate. The Senate approved 12% above the cuts that we made. It acknowledged that uh, we, uh, we could not afford uh, to fund our transportation and our housing needs and the community development block grant, which has been important to the city of San Antonio, uh, if we stayed at these across the board cut levels, which as Charlie was just pointing out over lunch, continue to grow through the next decade as a part of our cuts. So the chamber took the position, uh, we need a little more than what was in the sequestration bill. The House bill uh, wasn't satisfied with the sequestration cuts, and it cut that by 9%, below the agreed upon level in the budget deal. So a big gap there. And the, ha the House Republicans bring out to the floor just before we left what's called the THUD bill, uh, or the T-HUD bill. Either version kind of describes what happened. <laughs> and after it got out there, while they would all subscribed to the notion of the Ryan budget that uh, we, we'd only just begun to cut, they couldn't support their own bill. And they had to pull the bill from the floor. Mitch McConnell managed to block the Senate bill with the 60 vote rule. So we have no transportation bill. Just like Austin failed to adequately address the issue of transportation funding at the state level. We cannot get the roads and the other uh, improvements that we need either at the state or federal level unless we're willing to pay something for them. And that's the problem that we have uh, with the uh, budget bill and that we will have as we approach the brink of another cliff, maybe in October, maybe later than that. So on that happy note, uh, I invite your uh, questions and comments if there's time. There is plenty of time for questions. If Good. Any questions? On anything. Yes, ma'am. Right. Uh, you know, I think we should have been in Washington last week instead of next week to start with. Uh, I believe the, you know, the, I'm, I'm horrified like everyone else by what I see there. The question is, is there a military mission that is well defined and a plan uh, where we're not limiting our military to accomplish that mission that will make our family safer? And I've yet to be convinced that there is. As I understand what the president said, uh, back in that Lair News interview, what he wanted to do was sh do a shot across the bow of the Assad government. It seems to be a very dangerous and costly way to send a message. The idea is that when we have finished this mission, Assad will still be in power. Uh, he killed, uh, well, I guess he didn't, he, there, were both, there were two sides to this, but there were 99 plus thousand people killed by spraying them with bombs and mortars and a thousand plus killed through chemicals. I don't like either version. I would like to send him a message, but I'd like to do it in a way uh, that does not involve us in a regional civil war and that does not have America, either our military families that have been called upon to sacrifice so much or our taxpayers having to bear all the burden. So I will go to Washington uh, this weekend look at those classified documents that uh, Secretary Kerry was talking about yesterday in response to Rand Paul and the others, meet with colleagues, continue to get input from folks here in San Antonio, but at the current point, I lean against uh, the resolution. And if, what, if any, also, there was no reference to potentially Hispanic serving institutions or institutions of color, how that assessment might be undertaken with that consideration? Uh, very important uh, point. Uh, there is no doubt, I talked about the, uh, I guess the supply side, about trying through Pell Grants, through the tuition tax credit to make college more accessible for more individuals. But the other side is the fact that tuition has increased uh, at such a rapid level, at such a rapid rate in so many of our institutions. Uh, the president's program perhaps doesn't adequately consider the very issue you mentioned. In addition to the institutions that I referenced here in San Antonio, I have all of the Texas State Campus, which is a prominent emerging Hispanic-serving institution. Uh, I think 
that anything we do to try to put incentives for not increasing tuition as rapidly needs to recognize the varying populations within those institutions uh, in, in whatever we choose to adopt. Uh, and of course, the other reason that we have faced these increases at uh, the community college level, at uh, UTSA, at Texas State, is that the state has not been putting uh, its uh, fair share of resources into higher education just as it has not into transportation. So it's provided an incentive for tuition increases. Uh, our educational institutions caught between their own rising cost and the pressure of state government not adequately funding education. So uh, I don't think that the proposal the president talked about is likely to get adopted this year. I think it's important just as, uh, uh, and as you know, I'm hardly uh, a friend or ally of Governor Perry, though he does bring me here today in a way, uh, that <laughs> go, go, I was pleased Governor Perry has talked about this issue as well. Uh, and uh, I, th I think we need to keep it on the forefront of how can we keep college affordable. On any topic that is before the Congress, whether it's taxes or any of the other things I've talked about, if you're on the side of doing nothing, you've got the odds in your, in your favor. Uh, I serve uh, on the, uh, we, we divided it up into about 10 or 11 uh, study committees within the Ways and Means Committee, bipartisan study committees, and I participated, I think, in about nine of those. Uh, I do believe that there's merit to lowering the corporate rate. Uh, if you lower the corporate rate and don't make adjustments at about the same level for the individual rate, uh, then you encourage some shifting. I think that any changes that are made in the tax code have to be at least revenue neutral. We can argue about whether we need additional revenues. I personally think we do. But at a minimum, they have to be revenue neutral so we're not borrowing more money uh, or running up the debt in financing these uh, changes. So many of the people that are demanding change the most and talking about the complexities in the tax code were responsible for getting those complexities in there in the first place in the work that they've done to greatly expand uh, the size and complexity, as you know from your work uh, with the tax code. I'm hopeful something will happen eventually. It might be part of a year-end budget bill. Anything you care about on any subject might be part of a year-end bill because there may not be any other way to pass it, whether that uh, bill comes together and what form. Uh, remains to be seen. I know that, that Dave Camp, the Republican chair, and Max Bacchus, the Senate chair of the two committees, this is their last uh, uh, rodeo. And they have an incentive uh, to uh, try to get something included this time. It seems to me it's a big hill to climb to get anything in. Maybe we'll get a fragment of what we've been working on. And as I mentioned to you earlier, so many of you have different aspects, whether it's real estate, financial services, international, that I've heard from. But I welcome specifics about what you'd like to see done. Up, sure. I think it was appalling the way this was happened, and I'm not at all confident it will be much better during this year. I think you should be prepared uh, for that. Uh, because I, I see Richard and we're near a conclusion. Uh, my office is uh, right there across from the Frost Drive-In uh, on Travis Street. Uh, I welcome, we deliberately located right on the sidewalk level so that anyone can walk in. Uh, I try to devote a significant amount of time to being out and involved in community efforts and dealing with community issues here throughout Bear County. Uh, when I can't be to have a staff member there, uh, I welcome your coming uh, to Washington. I think uh, Dr. Elizondo told me he'd be there next week, and I believe we have a credit union delegation. Uh, but keep me advised of where I can join with you to partner to make a difference. I want to be sure that the priorities that I have in Washington are your priorities. We don't have to agree on every single issue to be able to work together uh, for the betterment of this community and I look forward to doing that with you in coming years. Thank you very much.